to open your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25 is where we'll be this morning for the next few moments together. We find ourselves in the middle of the Olivet Discourse, which I'll explain in just a few moments. And we want to look at the first parable of three parables that Jesus told in the middle of the Olivet Discourse. And so I want to read this first parable to you. Matthew chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourself. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. God, we pray for your uh, wisdom this morning as we look at your word. We pray for discernment. We pray for clarity. God, we pray for open hearts and open minds to receive your word. Lord, we invite your spirit to do what you choose to do in our midst. And Lord, I pray uh, that perhaps you would wake our church up this morning and use that te- this text to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was growing up, um, I did probably something very similar to everyone in this room. When you're a kid, one of the games that you like to play is, is hide and seek. Uh, so I had three sisters, so I would hide and they would find me. Uh, and then they would hide and I would not find them uh, on purpose. And, uh, but you remember that famous saying when you're playing hide and seek, you count and then you say, ready or not, Here I come. That's exactly what's happening in this text. Jesus is addressing the disciples. This sermonette is given to them specifically, the insiders, the 12. And he tells them essentially, ready or not, I'm coming. What's interesting about this parable that I just read to you is it's found in the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse is chapter 24 and chapter 25 of Matthew's gospel. And Jesus is responding to a, really a statement. It's not even a, a question that the disciples make and then they ask him a question, but he responds to a statement to help, help them see what's really important. He is only literally about 48 hours away from being crucified. On Sunday, the previous Sunday, Jesus had walked down the Palm Sunday path. We call it Palm Sunday. He walked down the Palm Sunday path. We call it the triumphal entry. He rides an unridden donkey. He goes in through the golden gate. He's there at the temple complex. And then there's a lot of things that happen during that time. There's one day of silence, but one day that is given to us of Christ's teaching between his triumphal entry and his crucifixion is the Olivet Discourse. He and his disciples have left Jerusalem just outside of the old city, we would call it today. And they've walked down through the Kidron Valley and they're going up to the Mount of Olives, which literally sits just a few hundred yards away from the Temple Mount and the platform that King Herod built. They're looking across at the platform and they make the statement, which is recorded in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They say, look, basically, isn't it beautiful? And it was. Herod's temple was majestic to say the least. It was uh, a feat in and of itself. How he built it, most people are still speculating. Uh, Some of the stones, which you can even see today at the base of the Western Wall, have been uncovered in recent years. And some of those stones are as long as 60 foot wide, 12 foot tall, and weigh 660 tons apiece. 
how Herod had those cut out of a mountain and had them moved and then stacked on top of each other is just really nothing we'll ever truly be able to figure out. But he did this over years and years of labor to build not a place for the worship of God, but a place for his own name. And the disciples are looking back at this magnificent temple complex with these unbelievably large stones, which are all carved out beautifully. They're called Herodian stones, and there is gold everywhere. Everything is just magnificent, and they make a very true statement, isn't this wonderful? And of course, Jesus responds to them and says, well, it is wonderful except for the fact that in just a short amount of time, every stone will be thrown off of each other. No stone will be left unturned. It had to be a shocking statement in and of itself because the disciples were thinking like, we don't even know how he got the stones here. Like, how could they just be thrown over? But they were in 70 AD under Titus the emperor, the Roman emperor who came in and led the forces. And they literally took their time with thousands and thousands of troops pushing over the stones. And you can to this day see the giant craters in the earth where the stones had fallen down to the ground and were buried underneath the earth. And so in 70 AD, the temple was destroyed and Christ was prophetically telling the disciples who said, isn't this beautiful? He says, you can focus all you want to on the world and even the most beautiful things in the world, but at the end of the day, it won't matter. It'll all just crumble and fall apart. He was clearly speaking about a coming kingdom, a new and better kingdom, a kingdom that would not topple, a kingdom that would last forever forever. He was referring to his kingdom, the same kingdom that he had been preaching about for three years when he called them to be fishers of men. And so they asked him a simple question, well, when will all this stuff happen? And so Jesus begins to teach them in chapter 24 about the coming of the kingdom. And then in chapter 25, he gives them three parables to elaborate on chapter 24. The first one we read about the 10 virgins. Jesus tells them in chapter 24 that it's going to be like birth pains. There's going to be like a ripe fig tree about to bear figs. It's going to be like a thief in the night. There's going to be an abomination of desolation. There's going to be uh, all these sort of things that are going to happen, wars and rumors of wars and turbulence all throughout the earth, even be peace at time. And Jesus says, when no one expects it at all, no human being, that's when I will come. He gets to chapter 25 and he tells three parables. He tells the parable that we read. He tells the parable of the talents and he tells the parable of sheep and goats. This story can only be understood in light of the entire sermon, the Olivet Discourse, we would call it, because it really doesn't make a whole lot of practical sense to us because we're 2,000 years removed from Jewish wedding customs. And to be perfectly honest, we don't really know outside of what Josephus tells us, a Jewish historian from 2,000 years ago, and what is given to us as evidence in the Bible, we really don't know a whole lot about the strange kind of wedding things that they did because ours are so much different. We do know a few things, and those few things are that typically a girl between 12 and 16 would be betrothed to a man between the ages of about 18 and 24. And the man would make a deal with the dad. We call it a dowry, right? He would, he would, you know, like, you know, you owe me three goats if I take your daughter kind of deal. That's just kind of how it went down. And so this young girl would marry this older man who had a job, who had perhaps a trade, maybe he was a carpenter, maybe he was a fisherman. There would be an agreement between her dad and him. And then after all that was settled up, then there would be a wedding feast and the wedding would be consummated. But also we know, and according to this story, that there were also escorts to the wedding. These people were uh, essentially people who would lead the parade. They would announce that there was a big celebration in town, and this celebration is really important because it's the institute that God created in Genesis chapter 2. It's vital to society and the health of society. And so they would select virgins, young girls who have not been married yet, to carry torches and to escort the bridegroom to his house along with the bride and they would celebrate with the giant feast. We call this the marriage feast and later it is called the marriage supper, right? 
And so that's what's happening in this story. It's a very simple story, but the simple story doesn't make any sense outside of the larger story of the Olivet Discourse. The simple story tells us this, and I paraphrase. There were 10 young virgins selected by the bridegroom and his family to escort the bridegroom to his home when the time was right so the wedding feast could begin. These 10 virgins were separated into two groups according to the story, five wise and five foolish. They all received the invitation. They all went to the house. They all began to wait. But the Bible tells us in verse 5, which is key, that the bridegroom was delayed in his coming. And because he was delayed, they did what everyone in this room would have done, including myself, is they became drowsy and they fell asleep. But eventually the Bible says that the bridegroom announced his coming, here I come, in verse 6, and he begins to come to the house. It's then that the five foolish virgins realize or maybe not even realize, but they come to a place where they recognize because the bridegroom has been delayed, well, we didn't bring extra oil. See, the five wise virgins brought an extra flask of oil. The lamps that are mentioned here are actually torches in the original language. They're long sticks with cloth wrapped around. They would be soaked in oil, set on fire to light the street. And once the fire would dissipate, they would soak it again and they would light it again. And so the wise virgins brought an extra flask of oil to, to light their torch. And because the bridegroom is delayed, they're glad they have it. The foolish virgins don't do that. So when the bridegroom announces his coming, they say, well, give us some of your oil. And they say, no, we can't do that. Then we won't have enough. You need to go to, to Walmart or wherever and buy your own. And so they do. They, they go out and they find someone who can sell them extra oil. And by the time they get back, the Bible tells us that during that time when they are shopping for oil, by the time they get back, the five wise virgins have already entered into the marriage feast and the door has been shut. Now, here's where it gets a bit staggering for the disciples. The Bible tells us in verse 11 that afterwards the door's been shut, the five wise are in the house. The foolish ones show up and they clearly knock on the door and they say, Lord, Lord, it's us. And this is where it's shocking. Verse 12, in Jesus' story, he's telling the disciples, he responds and says, Truly I say to you, referring to the five unwise virgins and the bridegroom, I don't know who you are. It's too late. So Jesus concludes his parable, the first of three, watch therefore, referring to the disciples, watch therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour. Now, there's a couple of things happening in the story, which I'll elaborate on in the next few moments that are interesting to see just in its immediate context. First of all, when it says in verse 11, Lord, Lord, the disciples instantly know what he's talking about because earlier in the ministry of Christ in Matthew chapter seven, it's recorded, Jesus said, talk to the disciples. And he says, on that day, many will cry out to me, Lord, Lord, right? They've heard this before. What also is staggering to the disciples when he tells the stories, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them because what is suggested in the text is that these ones who are invited to the wedding, when they show up at the door, although they're late because they weren't prepared, all of a sudden the bridegroom acts as if he doesn't know who they are. Does it make any sense? And it doesn't make sense if you just read those 13 verses outside the context of the Olivet Discourse. So what I would like to do is spend the next few moments going through that with you to make three observations from this story in the Olivet Discourse. What do we see that's similar about the wise and the unwise and we'll unpack this? Similarly, they've all been invited to the banquet and they all apparently have responded to the invitation at least initially with some positivity. They, sh they went to the house. So we have 10 virgins, 10 young ladies who have all been invited and they all 
somehow and in some way responded at least positively enough to show up at the right place at the right time. There's just something different in the Bible. That the word that Jesus used is he says they were not ready. But what does that even mean? We know that all parables are not allegories, and this is certainly one of those. We can't say that the Holy Spirit is the oil and they ran out of the Holy Spirit, so they had to go buy some more Holy Spirit. That would be dumb. Does it make any biblical sense? So clearly that's what's happening. What is happening is they weren't ready, and that's the key to the whole thing. The bridegroom is delayed and they're not ready, but what does that even mean? Like, like what does that mean, readiness? What is, what is he referring to? Well, Charles Spurgeon probably is the most helpful person here. When he says these words, Charles Spurgeon says that, that readiness is not a matter of outward presentation, but rather a matter of inward transformation. So in other words, they appeared ready on the outside because they did have a torch. They did have their wedding garments on. They were at the house, but there was nothing internally inside of them that caused them to think, you know what? I ought to make preparations because this is a really big deal. As a matter of fact, they were kind of flippant with the whole thing. It really wasn't that big of a deal to them. So they weren't really ready. And that way when the the bridegroom was delayed in his coming, they said, well, you know, just give us some of your stuff. Spurgeon says that the reality is their readiness was an indication that something on the inside was flawed. Something on the inside was not transformed, which is signaled in the fact that when the bridegroom announcement came, they had to go and search at that moment to get themselves ready. What's interesting about this story and all the other stories that are given in the Olivet Discourse is it becomes abundantly clear that crisis always reveals readiness. We know this functionally, right? I mean, many of you have been to funerals, you've attended funerals, you've had to participate in funerals. Maybe you've buried loved ones yourself. Many of you remember after 9-11, over 20 years ago, when that crisis hit, all of a sudden for about two months, our churches were full, right? Crisis always reveals readiness. Crisis, when it comes to your door, reveals like, you know what? Something's not right. Maybe I do need God. And that's what's happening in the Olivet Discourse. In all the stories and illustrations that Christ gives to the disciples on that day, it becomes abundantly clear that crisis reveals their readiness and there's coming a time when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and it will reveal on that, in that moment, on that day, whether your heart is right before the Lord or not. So I wanna make three observations, three. They are found in this parable and they are found in the Olivet Discourse because this parable is helping us see what Jesus is teaching. This parable intensifies the point that Christ is teaching. The first thing that we notice in the story and in the Olivet Discourse is this. Jesus is charging the disciples, but he also charges us and the church for 2,000 years has believed this. The church has always believed in the imminent return of Christ. If you do not believe in the imminent return of Christ, you literally are not uh, clinging to 2,000 years of church history and the teachings of Christ. The church has always believed in the imminent return of Christ. Why is that important? All three of these parables suggest to us a sudden and unexpected return. That it will be sudden, that it will be unexpected, that it will happen at any moment, whether it be right now Three years from now, 2,000 years from now, the return of Christ is imminent. God said he's coming back and he will come back. He gives us three parables. He gives us the parable of the bridegroom. He then gives us the parable of the talents. He then gives us the parable of the sheeps and the goats. In the first part of his teaching in chapter 24, he makes it abundantly clear in the discourse that the disciples could not possibly ever know that Jesus Christ or when Jesus Christ is coming back, but they must know that he is coming back. As a matter of fact, in verse 3 of chapter 24, the Bible says that they ask this question when Jesus makes the statement. They say, tell us when all these things will be. 
and what the signs will be of your coming at the end of the age. In other words, Jesus, if you could just give us a nice timeline so that we can, you know, figure this out, we can put it in our iPhone or Outlook calendar, we can, you know, put the alert on, and that way we're not surprised. But the Bible says that Jesus does not even answer their question. As a matter of fact, he says, well, it's kind of like this, boys. He says there'll be birth pains. It's kind of like a lady giving birth. She knows she's about to have a child, but she don't know exactly when. He says it's kind of like a fig tree. It's tender. It's starting to sprout leaves. You know the figs are coming, but you don't know when the figs are going to come. It's like a thief in the night. This is used by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You don't know when the thief is coming, but he'll come. And nevertheless, outside of all these evidences that are given in chapter 24, all these indisputable signs and precisely designated periods that Jesus talks about, about tribulation and abomination of desolation and all this stuff that the prophets mentioned in the Old Testament, the exact day and hour cannot be known by any human ever. It cannot. As a matter of fact, not even the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, knew in his incarnation when he would come back. That time is fixed by the Father, and it's so important for us to recognize that. The time of Christ's first coming was fixed by the Father. The book of Galatians tells us much. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his Son. In God's providence, in God's way, God will do what God desires to do when God desires to do it. Even the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, in his incarnation could not know. As a matter of fact, Jesus would even say one of the very last things he says to the disciples at his ascension. In Acts chapter 1 verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the epics which the Father has fixed by his own authority. Now why is that so important? Well, because again, the church has always believed in the imminent return of Christ, but there are so many amongst us that get so constipated about guessing when things are going to happen. As a matter of fact, I literally in my office have a giant file folder of 200 years of church history, at least the last 200 years of all these people who have predicted the coming of Christ. And every one of them has the same thing in common. They're all wrong. And by very definition, because most of them call themselves prophets, by the own def their own definition of a prophet, that makes them a false prophet because prophets are not to be wrong about prophecy. Read your Bible. But people spend all their time reading books and listening to these people talk on television and wherever else they can find them, guessing, and they're always wrong, and they make some excuse about why they're wrong. But why is Jesus so, so adamant that disciples need to not focus on the time, but rather focus on the fact that he said with his mouth that he is coming back? You see, in other words, he's asking them to cling to his word rather than the word of man. Why is that so important? Well, he gives us a very visual picture in chapter 24 that is so vitally important to our understanding of why it's important. He says, at the very beginning of his discourse, he says it's kind of like the days of Noah. Now, why is that an important illustration for us? If you remember the story of Noah all the way back at the beginning of the book of Genesis, Noah was charged by God to build a big boat in the middle of nowhere because rain was going to fall down from the sky. That hadn't happened before. And so much of it was going to come down and out of the earth and everywhere else that if he was to live, it would be because he had a big boat and, boat. and Noah wasn't given a timeline. He didn't know when the rain was going to come. He just knew that God had charged him to build a boat because God said, guess what? The rain's going to come. And so Noah got busy building the boat. But something else Noah did that a lot of people forget about, the New Testament mentions it to us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that for 120 years, you know what Noah did besides build a boat? He preached the gospel. For 120 years, Noah got busy with his hands building a boat, and he was busy with his mouth proclaiming that the rain is coming, trusting God. The rain is coming, repent of your sin, trust in God. The rain is coming, repent of your sin, trust in God. And guess what he got? No response. 
He didn't know when the rain was coming. Except for the day that God said, get in the boat. And God shut the door. And all of a sudden you could hear tap, tap. And the rain began to come down. You know what happened, don't you? As soon as God shut the door and the rain began to fall, the people began to beat on the outside of the boat and said, "Uh uh-oh, hey, Noah, we didn't believe you for 120 years, but we believe you now. The problem is the door was shut. For 120 years, don't miss this. For 120 years, God extended his grace and his mercy and his kindness on a planet that was so vile and so wicked that God had to wipe it out and start over. No one repented, but God was kind. He had warned them that the rain is coming. You see, the church has always believed in the imminent return of Christ. And the point that Jesus was trying to make the disciples is the same point he wants you to know and me to know and stop listening to false prophets on television and everywhere else we find them, is that he is coming. You don't need to know the time because what you need to do is stop looking at timelines and start building the boat because the rain's gonna come and start calling for people to repent of their sin and give their heart to Jesus Christ. Because once the rain comes, once the door is shut, it's too late. Jesus concludes in chapter 24 by saying it this way, in case it's not simple enough, disciples, it's gonna be like this. There's gonna be two men in a field. One's gonna be taken and the other one's left. A lot of times the Left Behind series has perverted this whole statement to make it look like some sort of rapture, but that's not the case in the text. It's talking about one taken into judgment and one left to enter the kingdom. He says there's gonna be two women grinding at the mill. One will be taken into judgment and the other will be left to enter the kingdom. It doesn't get any more simpler than that. What Jesus is pronouncing to them is, yes, there's birth pains. Yes, there's signs. There's always been for 2,000 years. But I'm telling you, I'm making a promise to you. I'm coming back. Get ready. Do the work. Preach the gospel. The church has always been affected because it's always believed in the imminent return of Christ. Therefore, the church has always been preaching the gospel to the lost and dying world. Hence the fact that we're here in Lakeland, Florida, 2,000 years later. God forbid that we start being lazy and not doing what the church has done for 2,000 years. The second observation that we see in the text is this, the Christian must be found ready and faithful at the return of Christ. It would also add the word alert. The Bible tells us in each case of the parable, at the return of the Lord, there ends up being two groups of people. There is one group of people that enter into blessedness. There's another group of people that enter into God's eternal judgment. Chapter 24 tells us as much numerous times in every illustration. And he gives us this parable, the first part of chapter 25, to tell us you better be ready. You better be found faithful at the return of Christ because I'm coming back. And when I come back, there'll be two groups of people, those who will enter into my blessedness or into my marriage feast and those who will not. It's important to also notice in the text that when the king shows up, when the bridegroom shows up, those who are rejected are surprised by the rejection. Here in the text, he's talking to the disciples. He's not talking to a bunch of people who don't know who he is. He's not talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the disciples. And here in the text, as he's talking to the disciples, he's talking to us, the church of Jesus Christ. You need to know that there will be many on that day who will be surprised at their rejection. Here in the text, he points to the fact that the Christian must be faithful and ready and alert because he's coming back and our readiness is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ as God has transformed our life. And if God has transformed your life, your response will be to get after it for the glory of God, to preach the gospel for the glory of God because you know he's coming back. Luke elaborates in Luke chapter 12, verse 35 and following, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and he knocks. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, he says, do not overlook this one fact, beloved, 
that with the Lord a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. There it is. He's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would reach to repentance. That is the story of Noah. Yes, it may seem like a long delay for us, but it's not for God. He doesn't live inside of space and time, as Francis Schaeffer would say. God holds space and time. And the only reason he's delayed, the bridegroom is delayed, is because he desires that all would repent and trust in his son, Jesus Christ. The Christian understands that, and therefore the Christian is ready and alert and faithful in preaching the gospel to lost ones around them. Many of those who are lazy and unready, if you will, it's because there has not been any transformation inside. But they will still be shocked on that day and be like, I, I thought. The third observation in the text is this. The return of Christ is the blessed hope of his children. I, I want to make, make a very simple point. I, I'm going to try to finish. The return of Christ is the blessed hope of his children. I, I, wanna, I just want to tell you something. This is where there's so much confusion, okay? Uh, let me just tell you what we believe. And I say we like as a corporate body of people, you may not believe this. But here's what our church believes. We believe emphatically that Jesus is coming again. As a matter of fact, our creed, our confession of faith, our Baptist faith, the message says as much. We believe as a church that Jesus Christ is actually coming again. You know, that sounds weird, Pastor, the whole thing with Jesus coming back. Well, it's not any more weird than him coming the first time and being born of a virgin. It's not any more weird than any other story in the Bible. It's supernatural, and God's sending his son back. And we believe that as a church, and we believe that on that day, the dead in Christ will be raised. We also believe this, following judgment, the saved will enter into God's glory and his blessedness forever and ever, and those who are lost will enter into a real place with the devil called hell forever and ever. Because there's not a lot of confusion about that. I think most of you who are here, you understand that. You may not fully agree, but that's who we are. But here's where there is a lot of confusion. I want you to listen to what I'm about to say. Your destiny, whether it be in heaven or hell, will not be determined at God's judgment. Your destiny, listen to me, whether it be heaven or hell, will not be determined at the judgment. The judgment will only reveal your decision that you've made for Christ already. In other words, when you go to the courtroom, it's already too late. Like you're not gonna barter with the judge, you're not gonna fix anything, it's too late. That's what Jesus is trying, it couldn't be any more simple. That's what Jesus is trying to help his disciples understand. That's why he was trying to help them understand the urgency of preaching the gospel because when that day comes, the decision's already been made. He'll separate the sheep from the goats. He won't decide on that day who is a sheep and a goat. They'll already be identified. But the beautiful thing for God's children in this life is that those who put their faith and trust in him, those who are faithful and ready and alert, our great hope is not nice buildings or the perfect government or less taxes and cheaper gas, although that would be really nice. Our hope is the fact that King Jesus is going to come back and establish his kingdom. And he will rule over that kingdom and will be God's people and God's place under God's perfect rule, just like Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 and 2. Think about that for a moment. There were five wise virgins who entered into the wedding feast and then the door was shut. Noah and his family entered the ark and the door was shut. Did you know the hope? of the follower of Christ is that one day God is going to come back and rescue us and make all things right. I think of the apostle Peter. In 72 AD, he is in the middle of a persecution that nobody in this room can even begin to identify with. Uh, Historians tell us that they would line up as many as 500 Followers of the way, that's the early church, 
in the Hebodrome at Caesarea Maritime in places like Bet Shane, another Roman city. They would line them up and they would ask them to recant their faith. And if they would not, they would turn loose the lions and they would maul the people and kill them all. Men, women, boys and girls, little children. And the people would applaud and clap and say, Hail Caesar. Peter lost a few friends, to say the least. He established the church at Caesarea Maritime when he met Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He probably led a lot of those people to faith in Christ. And when he writes to us his little epistle in 1 Peter, in the midst of this intense persecution, in the midst of knowing that some of his friends have been put to death in the most tenuous way, He writes these words, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. He was there when they looked at the stones. That'll perish. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power is being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ, his second coming. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And you rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. In the midst of a world gone to hell, Peter said, I have hope because my hope's not in this failing world. My hope's in a living Savior, and he's coming back. back." John put it this way because John was one of the other ones who was there on that day when Jesus looked at the temple and said, that won't last, but the kingdom's coming. John, one of the other apostles, now an old man, he's on Patmos. He writes the apocalypse to us, and he comes to the end of his book, and he reminds himself, which is so beautiful, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he reminds himself of the beginning of Christ's ministry. And he writes these words in verse 17 of chapter 22. He says, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And whoever will, let him take from the water of life freely. What is he, what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about what he wrote a long time ago in John chapter 4. The woman of Samaria, she's in Sakar. She's at Jacob's well. So much rich biblical theology there. I take you through the whole Old Testament and talk about this. But she's there. You know the story. She's been trying to find satisfaction in another guy, another guy, another guy, another guy, always leaving empty. She's a shell of herself now. She's been just victimized in everything else by every guy in town apparently. And Jesus shows up and he talks to her. She's a woman of Samaria. He shouldn't be talking to her. The disciples are mad about it, to be honest. He says, could you give me a drink? I was just there two weeks ago. I've never been there before. I went to Jacob's Well. Still there. Went down to Jacob's Well. Literally, it's a, like a 200-foot drop into the water. We were able to pull up some of the water and actually drink it. She said, I'd like a drink. She's like, yeah, sir, you don't, you don't have anything to draw from. He said, you're pretty, you're pretty right about that. He said, what you really need is to draw from me the water of life. John remembers that. He remembers what Christ says on the, the Mount of Olives. And now he's an old man. He's about to die. He's on a rock quarry and his life stinks. And he says these words. He said, oh, if you're thirsty, there's only one hope. And that is to drink from the water of life. And guess what? It's free. 
So he concludes the last book of the Bible by saying these words. Amen. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. For 2,000 years, the church has said, Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. The hope of the believer has never been in this world. The hope of the believer has always been in the gospel of Jesus Christ and his, his coming. But maybe you're here today and you put your hope in a lot of other things. I would encourage you today to put your hope in Christ. Let today be the day of salvation because you don't know what tomorrow brings. Once the door is shut, the door is shut. There will be no bartering on that day. Let today be the day of salvation. Give your heart to Jesus Christ today. Maybe you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, but to be honest, you've been a little sleepy. You haven't been acting like Christ is coming back. You can't even remember the last time you told anyone about Jesus. Maybe you would just pray this morning that God would awaken your heart to the gospel. And as the Apostle Paul says, that we would awake from our slumber and that we would get busy doing what God has called us to do. We're about to come to the Lord's table. The Apostle Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and tells us that we should not come to this table in an unholy manner or we'll bring judgment on ourselves. This is a holy moment. I know it's a cheap cup, it's nasty juice, and a wafer that tastes like cardboard. I get it. Doesn't seem like much, but it really is a holy moment because it's symbolic of what Christ did for us. And so I, I would encourage you, we're going to sing a song. I want to encourage you to respond. Maybe you just want to get on your face, say, God, awaken me from my slumber. God, save my neighbor. God, give me the boldness to preach the gospel. God, let today be the day of salvation for me. I don't know you. Maybe you need to repent of sin. Maybe you just want to pray with someone. I want to beg you to come as we sing the song, and then we'll come to the Lord's table together, and we'll celebrate his goodness. God, we love you, and we praise you, and we give you this moment as we sing this song together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together?